because I find it absolutely necessary to, to do some more with Grunewald and the Eisenheim altar. First, I want to show you this work that's uh, probably by him. Now that Grunewald is um, a popular artist, there's some question sometimes whether you're getting modern works that are like in the style of Grunewald, people sort of cashing in on his cachet. Uh, but this is in the uh, Washington National Gallery. So it's a small painting and it's maybe around 1520, but it is possible not to leave these shores and see something by him. As usual, it is by talking about a work that then I look at it more and think about it more. And I want to share some of that and then give you some additional material about it. I, last week, told you that the, the specific purpose for which this was made, that was to be in this sort of hospital hospice run by the monastery, the Antonine Monastery in, in the town of Eisenheim, and that it was for people who had uh, suffered usually either from the plague or ergotism to um, very serious diseases that often affected the skin. <clears throat> but I wanted to say a little bit more about ergotism this time, because as I think about it, it seems like a particularly terrifying disease. Um, as I said, it took a long time before several centuries after this, before there was discovered what was the, the cause of it. But it was a, it's a fungus that attacks grain. Only in certain soils and in certain climatic conditions. But uh, especially it attacks rye. And the rye was milled for bread, which was a staple of people's diet. So... It, the way, see, it wouldn't be like the plague where it would hit an area or even a neighborhood. It might be one family, another family, few people here, few people there, because it just depended on where their grain was milled and, and whether where their the rye came from. <clears throat> so it had that um, terrifying quality of being like just a lightning strike, plus they had no nothing to do for a person except to, to sort of ease their pain and restrain them while they had hallucinations. So it had this capricious, irrational quality. And it's more of the apparent irrationality in the image, which of course it can't be uh, because this artist is, um, whoever he was, going, that we now call Grunewald, he has to have a workshop. He has to plan this out. This is all a, a work of some degree of deliberation. And uh, I was thinking about that even more because <clears throat> here the, the alterations are away from it. It's built on very careful study of natural phenomena. As I'd said before, the, evidently the sores on the body of Christ here are exactly in their degree of... Um, disruption of the skin and the decay around them, that that's, that's could come from a medical textbook. And the plants that are shown here are also perfectly accurate. So it's grounded in that kind of reality. But then um, there are these free eruptions of another not rational world. But you know, that's not so different from what Durer was doing at the same time. But Durer did it in the direction of the classical. He wasn't just showing those lovely um, images that he captured in his sketchbooks, but then he simplified and idealized them. So he too is extracting, um, but just in a much more rational direction than what um, Grunewald is doing. <clears throat> so that was a, sort of the larger two points I want to make. And then I want to 
go a, a little more about some of my speculation and observation. I'm looking again at the two plague saints who flank the central scene of the crucifixion. I think, look at what he's done. It's obvious that these are uh, figures on pedestals if they, as if they were stone sculpture, only here they're animated and moving and have an inner and an outer life visible. Um, plus they have the color of life. But then I was even looking at the bases. If this were truly sculpture, as there is in the core of this, and as many altars, they're sculptured altars, the base would be parallel to the front, right? It wouldn't be on an angle like this. So it's as if, what? What's it doing like that? And then of course the leaves twist and droop as if they were not carved leaves, but real leaves. So that's just a small part. Then looking at the mastery of this composition where the Jesus's body had to be, of course, on one side of the split, how deftly he balances these two <clears throat> with the larger light area over here. And of course, that very prominent area of that hand so that you have something of visual interest in size and complexity that contrasts these three who are all compacted together. And I was thinking about something that I brought out last week, and that was the way he uses colors. In the, not as if they were changeable silks because the, the color shifts in the area of the garment and this angel or this one and we'll see in the resurrected Christ. And I was thinking about that a little more. <clears throat> the shifts always seem to be, well, with one exception, from a cooler green and gray to pinks and then to radiance. And I'm thinking that this is already part of the theological message. As you leave the earth, you move into the realm of incandescence and a realm of just spirit and light. So you have that in this angel. You have it in the adoring celestial Mary. Here you see it. We'll move in a little closer <clears throat> so that you see the way that shifts all the way up here. and in her, and then look what he does with her crown. It sort of emphasizes that, that these are crowns of flames rather than a gold crown that she wears as queen of heaven. And in the mountain, as you move up into the heavens to the presence of God, the mountain becomes transparent, the angels become transparent. I'll show you just this was the detail we looked at. <clears throat> you see the mountain vanishing into light there. And of course, as you're moving from left to right, you get to the culmination of that, which is a, to the, the final statement of the hope and belief held out for everyone who was there suffering and is going to die from this disease, that they will be reborn into a realm of light. So you see that same shift from the grays, pinks, reds, to incandescence. <clears throat> and there was, one thing more I wanted to say about these panels, then you open once more where you see the, <clears throat> on one scene, the, the torments suffered by St. Anthony that were recorded by his biographer, where he was assailed by demons when he was living in, in uh, seclusion in the desert, or here when he's um, visiting another one of the desert saints. Because of course, now the people who were in that in the 
in that hospice are secluded from the rest of the world. Um, so there's some parallel there. But it's to this image where there was this terribly plaintive text uh, that's from the biography where Anthony cries out to God, why did you, why did you not come and rescue me? Um, the rest of the text is that God said that he watched and he saw how valiantly he was uh, dealing with it. And, and then ultimately he comes down and saves him. But it was the image of the saint. I just flicked by this last time. This is an engraving by another important German graphic artist, I mean, Martin Schongauer. This is done in the 1490s. Uh, this is the artist that actually Durer, when he was taking his wander year after he finished his apprenticeship, had wanted to go study with, but Durer died. I mean, Schongauer died just about the time he got to where Schongauer was. This was a very popular print, as you might imagine, with its inventive demons. Um, there's even a record that Michelangelo, when he was a kid, made um, a painted copy of this. Look at what Shungor does. The way he presents the saint, you see him utterly unmoved and really unharmed. These cudgel bearing demons are certainly threatening him, um, perhaps pulling on his clothing, your claws sinking in. But in no way, uh, captures him here by the hand. But he he's, seems to be psychically and physically in, intact in this. And here, of course, what hair do you pull? Where it's really sensitive on the back of the head. You see how it's distorting his skull and that you can just imagine being pulled along the ground by your hair. And these are rushing, running in uh, at him. They're not doing anything to him yet. It's just coming. So it had, a, I think, a more um, convincing sense of, of um, just appalling threat. Well, I'm going to leave <laughs> that on for you. Well, I'll give you some information about the subsequent fate of this altarpiece. Uh, we might even be seeing it again next class, or I might be able to simply refer to it then. <clears throat> so this was in, um, Eisenheim was in that area, Alsace, which is that border territory between France and Germany that with various wars go back and forth. And in 1870, the Germans occupied this area. Now, some scholars, writers at that time, upon seeing this, uh, responded by saying, this is a painting that shows you the German character. Um, our willingness to suffer, our awareness of suffering, our, our um, being drawn to the irrational, just, um, well, anyway, that, that, so this was the native German character, which people were, framing and defining in terms of this painting. Then in, um, toward the end of World War I, for safekeeping, keeping, this painting was taken to Munich, to the, a museum in Munich, and it was cleaned and it was restored, and then it was put on display. And people flocked to see this because the Germans were by that time, uh, it was, they were losing. Um, there were special tours arranged for people to come, especially tours of wounded soldiers, many who'd lost limbs. 
and they came and they prayed here and there were services in front of this um, that people found enormous current solace, not from ergotism, but from the psychic wounds that, that are there from the war. Uh, here's some, someone at that time had written, um, never before had people made such a pilgrimage to an altar. It was like the Middle Ages. They came after four, more than four years, the masses gathered for the first time before the spirit of German artists. Probably the greatest we have ever seen uh, had to share their innermost common predicament. Well, at the end of the war, the altar <clears throat> by the Treaty of Versailles had to be returned um, to Alsace, which is again, French territory. And when it was, when it was taken away from Munich, here's another uh, report from a Munich newspaper. People stood and stared, moved, unsuspecting, knowing, the most touching were those with reverent expressions um, of the shattered layperson, schoolboys, workers, citizens, painters, old people, children. The red moving van stood below. A wretched reality, like coffin and grave, the lost war. One cannot keep back this thought. It's neither, um, well, it'd be subjective or sentimental. A piece of Germany is being cut away. The most noble part, Alsace, Alemannia, Grunewald. Um, Hitler made sure that this painting was saved during World War II because he had it um, placed in the basement of a, an enormous chateau that he had in Alsace. So he made it as pregnable as possible without putting it in a cave like the Ghent altarpiece was. But I'll come back to ways that influenced people in the um, 20th century in Germany, where between the wars, it's also connected with um, national suffering. And now we go on to the third of the great German Renaissance artist, Hans Holbein the Younger. Um, he, he was born in an area not too far from Munich and he died in London. So he's slightly younger than Grunewald in Durer. And that is slight difference in their age is going to affect his career. Um, well, I'll tell you just a little about him. Here's, uh, it's actually a very small image that's his self portrait. It's, it's been tinkered with. Someone else added the gold to it and wrote in up here and sort of expanded it on all side. But it seems to be that this is an authentic portrait um, by Holbein. His father had been a painter and he had a brother who was an artist. Um, and although I believe almost everybody who is a specialist nowadays would think of him as a, primarily as a portrait painter, he didn't start out as one. He worked in, well, he did religious panels. He did wall painting, so he did frescoes. He designed metalwork. He designed jewelry. He designed stained glass. He did woodcuts. He made it uh, printed alphabet. So an extremely versatile career. He traveled. He went to Northern Italy. He spent some time in France. But then his, his main center was in Basel in Switzerland. And Basel is a country, uh, a city that very quickly and very profoundly became a Protestant stronghold. And I've now said more than once, you know what impact that's going to have for painting, uh, for, would be for sculptors as well, that they're, one of their chief forms of commissions is no longer there because most Protestants would not allow religious imagery, at least not in, in churches. So I'll give you a few works of his, his early works that we have that survive um, when he's still in Basel. And this is one, The Dead Christ. 
um, it's around 1520, 1522. So this is just about the time that Durer is making that wonderfully exploratory jaunt to the um, Netherlands. Of course, this looks reminiscent of Grunewald because Holbein's father had taken Hans, the younger, to go see the Eisenhorn altarpiece. Now, it is known something about the circumstances of how he created this, but how, what this painting was used for, no one knows. It, it could have been um, worship panel, but it's a very strange proportion and rather odd. Maybe it was part of, to be the base of an altarpiece, like the, the scene at the base on the Eisenheim altarpiece, or could have been something over a tomb. Um, there are some Italian famous 15th century frescoes of um, a, the body laid on a tomb, a painted tomb on the wall, and then an, an effigy of the dead up above. So it's just, that remains a mystery. The interest in creating um, a very, uh, a truly veristic images there between the rucked up cloth. And the only thing that's quite, he, He's laid out as if he were a cadaver, though his eyes are still wide open, as is his mouth. The circumstance of its creation, as I said, we know something about that. It's based on a body that was shipped out, uh, was um, fished out of the river. So he, he used an actual cadaver as a model. And it would have that same kind of extremely earnest, deeply uh, searching identification with Christ, which was the content of the Eisenheim altarpiece. And far more in line with the Roman Catholic attitude than the Protestant. And this is called the Darmstadt Madonna or the Madonna of Jacob Meyer. It's about the same time, 1522, 23, um, <clears throat> when, he, when Holbein has this nice career going for himself in um, Basel. As you look at this painting, I think you'll notice more and more that's strange. This is a modern frame. I don't know what else there would be behind here. I think it, it looks like it's just the frame is fashioned to go around the main part here. Uh, so here's Jacob Meyer and members of his family. This is a particular type of the Madonna. She's called the Madonna of Pity. Um, the pity is that she has this long cloak and in her cloak, she uh, encompasses the family. Um, this is an Italian art, Northern art. It was just a very standard iconography. It's the family that's, uh, as you look at it, a little strange. Here's another quality of, of verism. Look, look at the Turkish carpet. It looks like it's just rucked up as if uh, as they were setting themselves in place. They just hadn't gotten around to tidying that up yet. Look at the size differences. Now here's Jakob. Oh, he said, if he stood, uh, he would at least be the size of her. To me, the head looks possibly a little larger. These are two little boys. Boy, they are not convincing. And then the three women. So it's doing again to get the balance to sort of mass them similarly over here. And this is very, oh my goodness. We'll just ignore the noise. Who is this woman? You can hardly see who she is. So the story behind this, Jakob Meyer 
was a devout Roman Catholic uh, merchant who had for a short time been the mayor of Basel, but uh, he was uh, removed from office for taking an enormous bribe from the French. And he was um, imprisoned for a while, but then he was released on the condition that he would never again hold public office. He, he was a devout Catholic and he never was converted to the Protestant cause. So he asked uh, Durer, Commissioner Durer, to do this portrait with his family. And at the time, his two son, sons had already died. So Holbein is imagining their portraits here. And also Meyer's first wife had died, but Meyer insisted that he wanted the deceased former members of his family also to be included. So the boys are there. And that's probably why she is shown almost if she were herself shrouded, his first wife. She'd been dead for more than 10 years. And then his current wife and Meyer's only surviving child, daughter here, Anna. We'll look at some details. It's not that actually Holbein used his um, mistress as a, as a time as a model for this and several other paintings, but she's also very much like someone else's women. Oh, here, we'll get this nice detail of it. And who that someone else is revealed by the kind of softened contours along here, the way there's pretty strong shadow along there and there, and no clear edge right there, despite the meticulous care. Oh, you could tell this man <laughs> uh, was interested in, in gold and metalwork, the, the scrupulous attention he does to all the arrangement of the crown. Well, what's it come from? It's somewhat like a Leonardo, that softened color, and even the, the kind of imagery of the, of the cherubs. In, would be in that younger child. So there's a, some Italian in that. Now here you have them. And there's even a Leonardo little Christ child in that pose. I'll show you that drawing that he did of Meyer. It's wonderful. Pencils had, were not yet uh, used. So this would be largely colored chalks and sometimes a little silver point. So no busy person is going to sit forever for a portrait painting that um, what Holbein would do was just go in and uh, sketches and then work from the sketches. Of course, he increases the intensity of the gaze there. And then the three women. And we're going to look mainly at her. Holbein left Basel in 1526 to spend two years in London. And when he left, this painting wasn't finished. And he came back in 28 and stayed until well, another four years before he went back to live in London for good. And during the, those years, this girl had become engaged because this is the drawing. That Holbein had made of her before 1526. When as a young girl, she has this marvelous long flowing hair. But when he came back, she was engaged. And now she's properly dressed with her hair up and with a headdress that would indicate this, this costume she would wear on her way to church. So he made that change. Living in Basel while he was there was our friend Erasmus Rotterdam. 
And the two of them became very good friends. You have seen this now, I believe, twice. This is Durer's uh, quick sketch that he made of Erasmus when he met him in, in the Netherlands in 1520. And then Erasmus had been just almost hectoring Durer to get a painted portrait of him. And Durer was really slow to produce it and ultimately did and instead this engraving from 1526, not based on his drawing. But we're getting to Erasmus. There's Erasmus, who corresponded with scholars across Europe and had great fame, needed many images of himself to send to uh, correspond with colleagues and send as gifts. Plus, he was a man of, of mm, sizable um, pride, evidently, and liked to be shown in certain ways. Well, he had um, Holbein produce, well, we know at least three portraits of him, including this one in 1526. By this time, Holbein had already done some illustrated woodcuts for some of the, um, the writings that, that Erasmus had done. And this is a very formal image. And I remember, I think it was Carolyn asked a couple of times ago, is, is it common to have all this writing on these paintings? Uh, evidently, that was something occurring, especially in the Northern art in 15th and 16th century. And it was a way of telling even more about whoever's likeness it is that you have here. Uh, so the text, there's some text up here, which I can't make out. But I'll tell you what it says. And then this one I can read down here. Um, so how does this man present? Erasmus paid for this. He commissioned this from Holbein to send to the last Roman Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury in England. And so this is a very carefully thought out image. He's well-dressed in these wonderful, huge fur cuffs with his um, fine features and he's just sort of as if looking off in thought. And then his character or what he does is then revealed by what's around him. His interest in classical antiquity. Well, this is a classical column here. His learning, look at the books. And this one, it says down here in Greek, it says the works of Heracles. Well, Erasmus didn't have anything to do with the works of Heracles. But, you know, it's like the labors of Heracles. What, what he had done was translate, provide a new translation of the New Testament. So that's what would have been in this bound book here, his, his great pride and joy. And what's written on the book up here is that um, it, it's, it's Holbein's signature, I believe. And then hear what he says. Uh, I am Johannes Holbein, who it's easier to mock than to imitate. So it's a prideful statement on the painter's part as well. Holbein provided a letter of introduction to Sir Thomas More in England. So this is when Holbein decamps, 1526. And why? Well, it's partly to get away from the ter religious turmoil. And it's at that point that his career, the career that we know is as a portraitist begins because portraiture was a very major form of the visual arts in the Tudor court of Henry VIII. Well, before looking at some for Henry VIII, let's look at a few more, including several additional ones by Holbein of of Erasmus. There are so many, and there are so many variations, and there was such a demand for them. You can't always be sure whether you have the original or you're looking at a, um, something produced in the study, in a study as, as a copy. But this, this one's in the Louvre, and it's a very, very handsome one, where he's shown as if he's at home in his study with this nice tapestry back here. Look how much of the whole picture surface is covered by his image. What a wonderful and still very 
subtle way to flatter the man. When you're looking at this, you can't forget what in the world it is he's writing. But the next one, I'll show you, you can see what it is he's, the text he's producing. So it's always Holbein the fine, refined scholar. This one, which is a, on, on paper that's been transferred. And here you can see what that says. And it's um, the first lines of uh, Holbein, Holbein, Erasmus's commentary on the book of St. Luke. And this would have been made probably the same year that, that um, Erasmus published this. And can you see that this is just, uh, well, the head, angle of the head is slightly different, but look at this. They're almost identical. And then here's one that um, after those two years in London, Holbein came back um, to Basel for a while. And this is one that's in the Met. It's a little tiny one. And here he does show Erasmus as an older man. In Manhattan, if you want to go see just a superb Holbein portrait, you go to the Frick. Um, at least in the old days, before the Frick remodeling, there would be um, on either side of a major painting by El Greco, two portraits by Holbein of two Englishmen who were arch enemies. This is Sir Thomas More, and this probably is 15... Well, let's see if I can give you the exact date. In 1527. So it's a year after he'd gotten there. See, Erasmus sent this letter of recommendation uh, to Moore, uh, a letter of introduction almost, uh, that Holbein took to him. And um, Moore, who's this great scholar, government figure, um, then I guess the two men really took a liking to one another, and Holbein settled either in his household or lived very near him. And he does this great portrait with um, I a feature that I find actually when I look at it in, in re reality is, is almost jarring is the, the velvet of these sleeves and the vividness of the light on those. But it's, it's meticulous detail like a, a Van Eyck detail would be. Uh, he's looking off into space, very carefully opposed man. His, uh, elaborate collar here. This is a motto of Henry VIII about um, always remember me. And this would be a piece of paper that would indicate some official business. Holbein also did one of the Moore and his whole family. It's the first group portrait known to ever been done. And here's his drawing for it. You notice the direction of flattery would be to make someone look older and more responsible. So here you can see, even see the stubble. Well, so we know what happened to him in 1535. He was beheaded because he, um, well, let's put it mildly, balked at Henry's break with the Roman Catholic Church when the Pope refused to annul Henry's first uh, marriage. And Moore did not go along with Henry's actions. And so ultimately he becomes a Catholic saint. And this is the one that would be on the other side of the, in the Frick. This is Sir Thomas Cromwell. I mean, yeah. And this is 1532. So there's five years in between and a lot of history in between. Um, Sir Thomas More is still alive, but he's completely out of favor. 
Cromwell has, um, has come from really humble beginnings and he's worked his way up and he's now uh, the most influential figure. He is thought of as the Engli father of the English Reformation. He encouraged Henry in the creation of the Church of England. And here he's shown with a, some religious book here and then state papers, presumably. And he's looking off into space. There are three different paintings of this and the Frick here and in other places never really suggests that this is anything other than the original. Sources outside the Frick sometimes think, oh, maybe this is one of the copies of the original. But the very interesting thing is, just look for yourself at the way Cromwell is presented as opposed to this. Look how much closer he is to us, which means we are closer to him. And he looks off in the distance, but here, not only is he farther away, but he looks away from anywhere we, where we could look. So I would say, that much now as Holbein is nimbly staying on his feet and keeping his career by moving from the center of power to now in disgrace to the new center of power and working for him. Um, but, but just don't get the sense that this is a very, that Holbein himself is particularly sympathetic to him. Although he doesn't, a neat trick of making the wainscoting stop just below. So then the light color, only thing light in this area up here is the face. But still, he's remote. He's presented as remote from us. Then the one very fine painting in the National Gallery in London. I encourage you to go on YouTube and see the I think it's a half hour video by one of the curators at the National Gallery taking you through this painting, which is known as the Ambassadors. And a great deal is known about this painting. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen it. The size of this is, oh, it's a little less than six by six feet and it's signed and dated by Holbein someplace down in here, which I can't find, um, in 1533. These were two French ambassadors to Henry's court. Uh, this is the man who commissioned the painting, Jean de Dunfield, who was there uh, as a stand-in for King Francis I of France when Holbein, I mean, when uh, Henry made this next marriage. And he had some sort of, was trying to maintain peace between France and England. He was there for two years and he didn't like it at all. But for a short time, his good friend, Georges de Sèvres was there, who was a bishop, who was also on some diplomatic mission and we don't know what it was. But this man commissioned the painting that was going to go in his, his chateau um, in France. And this is replete with symbolism and the most perfect painting. I hope when you look at this, you're a little bit taken aback by, he's so young. Yes, both these men are in their mid twenties. And what a tour de force of painting. Look at each little hair of this lynx fur or the satin shirt here. his friend, two years younger than him. From the angle of your, their eyes, you have a sense of the difference in their take on the world. The very keen gaze here and a little bit more subdued there.
And then this cluttered table in between, and well, what, what we deal with the most obvious too. But these are everything in here probably was chosen by um, the patron. This is a skull. You have to be looking at it from down at this corner, looking up at the painting for it to take its accurate scale. But so there is that reminder of death. That's an appropriate object in scholar studies because it's an appropriate thing for a person to study the mortality. But it's also a, a, a tour de force. And then there's a little tiny crucifix up here, which might be an oblique way of referring to the current religious strife where in England, the Catholic Church is now hidden largely. Now, uh, objects on the this um, this is a Turkish carpet, and then on the top of this, they're mainly scientific instruments, and they're both a well, a lot of them are they, they, with measuring time, and there's a celestial globe. Um, one of these very complicated pieces was made by a goldsmith of Henry VIII. And then down here, there are musical instruments and a globe. The globe turns so that the town, the hamlet, where the chateau owned by this man was, uh, and where the painting would be displayed, is what's most prominent on that. Uh, but just look at a few of these. Great. Now, this is where Georges um, the Sèvres age is indicated. I taught his age, and then it's 24, so that'd be this equivalent of 25, and these marvelous instruments. And you can see even the tufts. And then you get down below here. Uh, this is a Lutheran hymnal, it turns out, but Depends, scholars, we spent our time looking at all details. There is no uh, printed Lutheran hymnal of that time that put these two hymns adjacent to one another. And the musical, the lute here has a broken string. There's a case of flutes here. There's a missing flute. This is an arithmetic book and it's on a page, I think it's about divisions. So it's as if these are all references to the discord of the time. And there's that skull. Well, when Holbein first went to England, he, he worked already for Henry VIII, but he was doing more or less some of the kind of ambitious work he had done in Basel. He did some uh, mural paintings that he did a ceiling painting um, for palaces that have subsequently been destroyed. Um, and it wasn't until he returned in 1532 um, that he began to work more for Henry and he became ultimately Henry's um, court painter, court portraitist. Uh, here's uh, one of those chalk drawings that Holbein made, because of course any busy monarch is not going to sit uh, repeatedly for an artist and Holbein can work from that. I'll just give you some idea. Look at this. This was an idealizing portrait of, of him. He, as he got older, he got enormously obese, but also this kind of spreading legged, a uh, broad shoulder, huge padded shoulder, that's an assertion of authority. And you see, he was trying that out when he did this. He's kind of working up to it. This is all that remains from a large work that, that Holbein did, and then there's a terrible copy of it here. And it was a dynastic portrait of Henry with his first while well, his second wife, Jane Seymour, the one who bore him a child, um, Edward VI, and then Henry's parents back here. And this is probably made, the original was made probably to commemorate the birth of his heir. 
then all these are different copies that were made off it. Sometimes, maybe this is an original one. There's this one. This is a quite well-known one. See how even the shape, everything is emphasize the girth of this man, the curve of his hat, the curve of this uh, great necklace here. Um, and he's bursting out just as his tufts of his shirt burst through here. He seems to be bursting out to the great circle there. Oh, flattery all the way. And there's his queen, Jane Seymour. And now this is appropriately neutral. And there's very careful detail of her and her clothing, no setting. Um, this would be the kind of um, decorum appropriate uh, for the painter and for the sitter and for people looking at a painting not to feel too intimately associated with her. You know, she died in childbirth or immediately subsequent, but here's the drawing for it. And one of Holbein's jobs then as court painter will be to provide Henry with painted likenesses of prospective future brides. And this is one that's really a handsome painting of Christina of Denmark. Um, Henry really liked this, um, but the marriage negotiations fell through. So, But it kept the painting until he died. This is 1538. It's almost six feet high. So it's, it's uh, big, very nicely done. That He just indicates the space for it by there's a corner of a room and she casts her shadow. And she's quite demure. She was only 16 at the time this was done. It's quite lovely. This is Anne of Cleves. Uh, Cromwell was encouraging Henry to marry her. So Henry sent Holbein to Brussels, I believe, is where she was at the time, to do a painting so Henry would have some idea of what she looked like. He brought it back, and Henry liked it enough that the marriage was arranged. But when evidently when Henry saw her on the wedding day, he said she looked like a flat, fat Flemish mare, and he had the marriage annulled as soon as possible and found reason to have her killed very shortly afterward. After that, Holbein had no more commissions from him. And soon there was found a reason for Cromwell to be executed as well. There are, I don't know, hundreds of portraits ascribed to Holbein. He also did miniatures, not, you know, on paper, large, life-size, half-size. He and his workshop really very clever. The last work by him, though, that I want to show you is something that he did early, back when he was still in Basel back when he was uh, working in the vicinity of Erasmus, he um, had been, I mentioned before that he, he was, he made woodcuts and he did a woodcut. Um, it was his idea of a book of the dance of, the, um, the dance of death of the dance of the dead. And this, it was so popular within, I think it's less than 40 years. There were 11 editions of it in multiple languages. But this is just an example of the book. And then we'll look at a couple of the illustrations. They are two and a half inches big. He didn't do the cutting. He made the designs, uh, an extraordinarily skillful cutter, made the designs for them instead. But Holbein, these are Holbein's conceptions. Uh, for about a century, there had been this, uh, there are paintings that are about the dance of death. And the theme is always, that death comes when you don't expect it, and death comes to people of every class of society. And there would be like long murals, and they would show a skeleton 
with a king, with a beggar, and they would be like doing a round dance. Now, he does something different. He just takes them each episode as, as the, the death um, comes upon the person. So here, this is an emperor. Sometimes the figures can be recognized. I don't know if this is to be, I think this is meant to be Maximilian. Every page somewhere there should be the hourglass. But here he is surrounded by his courtiers and death is adjusting his crown. Now with a strong anti-Roman Catholic cleric point of view in Basel, you might imagine that there's going to be a strong anti-clerical view in some of the images. This is the death of an abbot where the skull marches off with his crozier and his mitre and he's protesting and he's chubby figure here. He's just really happy prancing. There's a, some comic quality in these. This is an abbess being pulled away. A knight. Now death is dressed up on armor as well and is skewering him with his own lance. A countess is being dressed in all her finery. And how much like a sycophantic courtier with the bend of the body here of our death. A lady, oh, is she parading all her finery and his sort of unctuous attention to her? Look at the grin. A physician. See a sick patient being brought in, but it's a physician who's going to die. And there are several that are very charitable. Here, an old man, and he's helping him along. The last one I have is the death of a child in the peasant hut. I saved this for last because for this one, we still have one of his original sketches. So uh, this is the authentic emotion, much more obvious, of course, in this. But just to think of this reduced to that two and a half inches. Think of yourself looking at something that small, that intimately, with that intimate and personal subject. It'd be quite as effective as a devotional book. Well, I don't know how that happened, but that just took the time because I will just let you know what's coming next week. We are going to have more art and politics. Um, we are going to be starting with a Caspar David Friedrich, an early 19th century artist who was Hitler's favorite and a movement in art that Hitler admired. And then we're going to move into the 20th century art, especially the reaction to between the world wars of the Weimar Republic and the strong reaction to the decadence of society and the suffering of people. And that is it for today. As ever, I will close this out and welcome comments and questions. Anyone?
Oh, everyone's well muted. I see that. This was a lot to take in. Hi, this is Joy. Hi. Um, this was a lot to take in, Maggie. Um, I'm just bored by the detail, well, the descriptions. Yeah. Well, let's hope now that it's working effectively that they're getting on YouTube quickly. So I will repeat what I was told last week. Just you can look under my name or you can look under Mill, and I think that they'll show up. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.